Hello everyone and welcome to today's Teaching Tip Live. Today we're going to be talking about the uh, lab course and we have with us today uh, Abel Bolt Ito who is a professor of neurobiology at the Department of Biology and Wildlife in the College of Natural Science and Mathematics here at UAF. Joining us also we have Sean Holland who is an instructional designer here at UAF eLearning. We also have Owen Guthrie, an instructional designer at UAF eLearning, and myself, Kristen Bufard. And to get things started, I'm going to pass off to you, Owen. Hi, thanks, Kristen. Um, we're really excited today to talk to you about a project we've been working on here at eLearning for about a year. Um, in fact, uh, this project began um, informally in, in the first stages um, when we at eLearning were talking about what sort of uh, opportunities we had at the University of Alaska for MOOC creation. That's a massive online open course. Um, and, you know, there was quite a bit of hype, oh, maybe even two years before that, about these, these courses. And so we were thinking about different topics and subjects and working with different faculty, um, exploring the concept. And I had a meeting with Diane Wagner, uh, then department chair of the Biology and Wildlife Department uh, on West Ridge there. And, um, we discussed the idea a little bit and we both agreed that, oh, maybe there might be some interesting marketing potential to attract students to some of the interesting course offerings that University of Alaska Fairbanks has. And about that same time, uh, Abel Boltito had uh, an idea. And so I thought I'd let him speak to his idea uh, himself in his own words. So here's Dr. Boltito. Thank you, Owen. Well, this was a, an idea that was born on an airplane ride uh, after meeting. A colleague of, me, of mine had, had asked me to uh, read an article on MOOCs, a Massive Open Online Courses, that were, uh, was in the uh, Alaska Airlines magazine. So I started reading that article. And then um, I took my uh, notepad from the, from the hotel, and I just started furiously writing ideas about how I could adapt this MOOC model into a model that would allow students to do online research, um, but not for free. So the MOOCs are generally free, uh, unless you, know, you want to take it for credit, then you might have to pay a tuition. But this was a, a hybrid model where we would create a, a massive o uh, online research experience or more experience in behavioral neuroscience. And uh, and then I, it it was really happenstance because when I thought about this and that was in C September last year, um, I I I brought this idea to Diane Wagner, my uh, my department chair, and she had just talked with Owen about a MOOC. So then I started talking with Owen, and um, and then I only had the chance to start really writing up a, a real proposal. Uh, a couple of months later, when um, when I had more time, so I'm not sure, Owen, um, you know, where you would, if you want me to continue with that story, or if you have another angle you wanna. Continue. Well, let's talk. Let's talk a little bit about um, the idea itself. Like, what 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 were you thinking of in terms of having students do for your course? What was your epiphany? Well, the epiphany was to do cutting edge behavioral neuroscience research using li real life mice in a completely online environment. And that would require uh, videotaping of a lot of mice for different behaviors, and then allowing the students to analyze and collect data from those videos. So the only thing that the um, students would really not be doing is handling the mice. But any, everything else they would do um, as if they were in the lab themselves. And I think you know, from our perspective here at eLearning and from the, the awareness we have of sort of global online science courses, that idea itself is quite innovative. The idea that students can participate in animal research directly at the undergraduate or even high school level, actually ob observing behaviors firsthand or through a video recorded uh, medium and conducting their observations on their own and contributing to potentially publishable scientific research. Um, and, and the idea that it's so scalable, right? It doesn't matter if it's 50 students or 5,000 students or 50,000 students, each student is conducting authentic research 
on their own, and that was really exciting for us to be to be involved with. And um, so f there was some bureaucratic hoops to to move through, uh, just because it was sort of a a different model, maybe different courses. There were two or three different co course cohorts within the same uh, basic course community. So you might have students taking the course for no credit or for one credit. Um, or doing independent studies for potentially more credit, all within the same community, which is also administratively innovative, I think. Um, so we, working with Abel, we talked a little bit about, you know, what, what his vision was for the design. Uh, we had some of our own ideas for having, making sure his presence was really strong, and he right away um, perceived that a really important aspect of the success for an online student was to have his presence be felt for, for the for the participating students. So um, we, we went with a video heavy design and we chose Canvas as our platform. Uh, it has a little bit cleaner look, uh, a little bit more open space or white space on the page. Um, and so we started right away doing some design work there. And uh, it gave us at eLearning an opportunity to, to experiment with some, I won't call them innovative because they've been around for a while now, but for some new design models uh, that we hadn't played with very much, which was some design sprints and where Sean and Kristen and I uh, camped out in Murray Building and in a conference room for two solid days, I think two and a half days in June of last summer, and uh, really hammered out most of the structure of the course based on Obel's fully fleshed out schedule and syllabus that we got from him ahead of time. And that was sort of a rough uh, skeleton, and then um, Obel really had to Crunch, crunch it out, and <laughs> he's laughing because there was a lot of work to be done. Each, each module had to be written, um, references had to be gathered, citations, and then building this this array of uh, of videos to accompany each module. Um, so, so can I jump in here? Please, Owen? yeah, please. Because um, so, just to give a perspective of where we were. So, in the spring of of this year, I took um, videos of 90 mice from six different strains. And then uh, videotaped five different behaviors, uh, a couple of which we had never looked at in the mice. So this is this comes to the uh, cutting edge research part of the the course. But then, when we got to September and the course started, we had about I think about four modules ready, right? About three or four weeks of work, and we thought, oh, we're doing really great. At, at least I I thought we we're do doing really great. Well, after four weeks, we were about two days ahead. <laughs> So it turned out to be um, a, a, a really a, a challenge to stay stay up to date with with the content. But we managed. We managed. Now, one of the things that I really want to stress here that this is a scientific, scientifically really rigorous class. So students um, get access to peer-reviewed literature. So I went to uh, PubMed Central, which is the uh, central open database of peer-reviewed uh, literature of the National Institutes of Health. And I provided students with a sufficient background, scientific background, to be able to put what they were doing in the lab online in, in the context of what we know about um, the science that we were discussing. So, and, and that uh, it might be interesting at this point we can bring Sean in to talk a little bit about more details about the module design because there were some innovative aspects I think about the module design as well. Again, maybe not as innovative as the basic premise of the course, having students conduct uh, unique first-hand research, but um, there were some interesting aspects pedagogically I think that bear mentioning and structurally. So um, I know Sean is waiting over there desperate to share his screen with some fantastic insight. So, Sean, take it away. Sure. Uh, thanks, Owen. Um, <clears throat> where to start? Uh, yeah, not only is the was the genesis for the course innovative, but I think the way that we integrated existing tools to create uh, an experience for students was also, um, I, yeah, I think you could say it's innovative. Uh, logistically, the course is very complex, um, and it involved some, some real sort of Thinking on how to how do we make the data gathering um, uh, robust, but at the same time easy for students. Uh, so uh, we hosted all of Abel's uh, data collection videos on Google Drive, and then we use Google uh, Forms and Sheets to collect that data. Um, 
and then all of the instructor presence videos, those were on YouTube. So we had, we're using Google Drive and YouTube at the same time. Um, Canvas was a new experience for us. And it, I think that, you know, it's like Blackboard, it's a learning tool, but it allowed us, I think, to, to really um, tailor the experience to the students and direct them through the content from module to module in a really, um, uh, really specific way. So we were Canvas allowed us to make um, some very focused choices on what kinds of assessments we wanted to do, how we wanted to allow students to progress uh, through each module. So um, uh, I'll go ahead and show an example of a module in Canvas. So this is uh, the start of module six. On uh, this is on anxiety, and as Abel mentioned before, um, the readings, all of the readings for uh, each section are listed at the beginning of the module and then referred back to throughout. Uh, throughout. So uh, in Canvas, it's sort of this progressive uh, structure. So once you read one submodule, there's an automatic, there's a next button on the bottom of the page to allow the student to move through. So we have it, each module sort of staggered with content and quizzes. So it's a, a lot, uh, usually there's like a, a, a content section and a quiz, and a content section and a quiz. And as you can see, um, this quiz is, all of our quizzes are practice quizzes. They're technically ungraded. Uh, students are allowed to take them as many times as they want. Um, you know, a hundred times if they if they needed to, but they have to get a perfect score in each quiz. Um, but they can't see the right answers. So the only point that they know that they got all the answers right is when they finally do. They can't just see the right answers and go back and, and plug them in. Uh, but so they're low stakes and persistent. If we go back to uh, the module view, you can see there's a quiz in between every uh, content area of the module. I think I'm going to cut in for just one second, second there, Sean, and mention that I think that's particularly innovative, or at least effective, in engaging students. They, they have a small amount of content, and then we provide them with a, a it should, the quizzes are only one to three questions. And we're really focused on student learning, and ABBA was flexible and sort of open to some different ideas there. Instead of having a graded quiz, oh, you got a 60%, and now you move on, we really just wanted students to obtain that, that competency or 100% or understanding before they moved on. And we really weren't interested in um, grading them down. We really wanted everybody to have a full understanding as they progress through the course. So it's a, it's a little bit of a different way to think about traditional science education. Um, but in a really neat way, I think. And the students seem to respond positively to it. So, all right. Pardon my interruption. Uh, no problem. Um, thanks you, thank you for interrupting me, actually. Um, there was only one other thing I wanted to show, and that was how, um, what it looks like to have everything in a sequence so that, uh, you know, a student has to complete everything in, for example, in this module seven. Uh, you can see that we have the, um, this checkbox selected. Students must through, move through requirements in sequential order. So they have to view 7.1. They have to score at least a, a 2 on quiz 7.1. So they can't move on to 7.2. They can't even view 7.2 until they've completed, uh, gotten a perfect score on the, the, the assessment, the sort of low stakes assessment for the very previous submodule. Um, and we were worried, I think, at first that this might be frustrating for students, but I think because the um, the quizzes, as they're called, I'm not sure that's really the right word, um, because they're so low stakes and they're only between, I think the most had four or five questions uh, in the entire course, and most were one or two or three, um, really there was not a lot of, there's nothing to get hung up on between, uh, between modules. So, um, and as you can see, there's, uh, Canvas allows different types of um, requirements. So for the um, sort of capstone discussion in each week, uh, students have to contribute to the page. And, and that, that discussion is the only graded item um, week to week. So, All Super. Right. That's fabulous, Sean. Thank you. Um, so that's 
part of the critical. We got, I got a little bit of echo from Sean, so that he turned his mic off. So it's better, all better now. Um, so one of the aspects of the course I think is particularly interesting is that there are three or four major sort of research experiences within uh, the larger framework of the course. And I thought it might be interesting, Abel, to have you talk a little bit about um, student participation in those, how their data uh, results look, and your impression uh, for teaching the subject for almost 20 years um, with working with students conducting this kind of research. So back to you. Thank you. <clears throat> so um, the course contained four unique experiments for the students to complete. And that generally meant about three modules per experiment. One is background, second one is training and collection of the data, and then the third one is the analysis of the data. And the analysis here means to um, calculate averages uh, per group of mice, uh, or even for an individual mouse, and I'll get, get back to that. Then for the group, the, the strain um, group of mice, and then um, look at the experimental setup and have them uh, present their results in, in a graphical form, in a figure, a bar graph, or a, or a line graph. And the, the unique thing about uh, this is that this is a collaborative um, engagement for the students. Each student is uh, one of four one of four groups and so I had about four or five students in each group so we have four groups a total and each group would have their own unique set of 20 to 23 mice to analyze. So then when they submitted the, the data I then combined all the data sets from the different groups and ask the students to sort the animals by ID so that they could um, um, calculate an average per animal and then use the averages per animal to then uh, calculate the experimental group averages um, in the experiment. So th there, there are two important things about this. The students did not know the, I the identity of the mouse. That is, they didn't know what strain they came from or which experimental uh, procedure they came from. So they were blind to the treatment. And so they, uh, their re results were not biased at all because they did, simply did not know uh, where the animal came from. Uh, secondly, because each I had a data set for one animal from four or five different students, I could do a quality control of the data. So I could look at each student and their numbers and um, look at them and see if they may had made any errors or even more importantly whether they had just put in a set of random numbers and just try to get by that way. And I, I'm really pleased to say that that never happened. Uh, the most I saw was one or two errors uh, where students had uh, you know, put in a blank uh, by mistake or they had put in the wrong number by mistake. But um, I never saw more than two errors uh, in any particular student data set. And this is a, a, an independent way to ensure that the student were doing their actual work. And you have to realize about 50% of the time in this course is, is lab-based. It's the collection of data from the videos. At the same time, I think it's really neat that students are demonstrating their understanding of the instructions for how to collect data by actually applying that knowledge in the collection of data. So that's, that's also must be more interesting as, as our later interviews with students turned out. It is more interesting for the students to demonstrate their understanding via actually doing something. Absolutely. You're, you're absolutely right. Yeah. So uh, uh, without giving away any obvious research publications that are going to be coming out, how, overall, um, the student discussions and the uh, experiments, any, any thoughts on those? <clears throat> the quality of the data has been phenomenal. Um, because we had several students um, collect data on the same animal, we had an incredible um, way of, of making sure the data was, um, was correct and as close to what it should be, you know, had a, had a computer program done the same thing. Um, we have found some really novel results. Um, even in existing experiments, 
where uh, we had done this experiment with these mice before, but because we now had a video, so let me explain one experiment. This is a um, digging behavior of the mice, and that's considered a compulsive-like behavior. So these are mice that were selected to build big nests and small nests. The mice that build big nests, so they use a lot of cotton for their nest, they're the compulsive-like ones. They also do a lot of digging. And usually we put the animal in a rat cage, uh, five centimeters of, uh, of bedding, then 20 marbles on top, and then we put them in the cage for 20 minutes. After 20 minutes, we, we check how many marbles are buried, and that's their marble burying score. So the more marbles are buried, the more compulsive-like they are. Well, now we have the entire video, and so I asked the students to, to measure the number of marbles buried at 5, 10, 15, and 20 minutes. And the results were really surprising in the sense that after 10 minutes, the differences that we see after 20 minutes are already significantly different. And this tells us that with the strains that we are using, we can actually reduce the, uh, the length of the test to 10 minutes. Hmm. That's really That's cool. cool. I see That's that cool. John is pulling up some uh, examples of the data collection. So I'm going to turn it over to him for a minute and let him share with us what he's screen sharing and talk about it that. Uh, sure. I just wanted to show what it looks like, what um, Dr. Boltito is referring to. I think it's important to see what that looks like in practice. Um, so uh, the data gathering on the marble burying was module four. So we created a video that showed um, how to how to gather the marble burying data. Um, so it has uh, clear instructions from Dr. Boltito, a narration over uh, actual video of the, um, uh, I'm not sure what these are called, these, <laughs> these bins in which the, the, the um, mice spend 20 minutes and the students collect, count how many marbles are buried at, at uh, uh, five minute intervals. Um, so we had the students, uh, we had kind of this gatekeeping exercise to make sure that the students really understood how to count the marbles because there were some nuances in, in that data gathering procedure. Um, and then, as the students move on past that, um, they're asked to uh, take a quiz on what it is that they need to remember for data gathering. And then they're brought to this page where they are given some more instructions on watching the videos. Uh, because they were 20 minutes long each, we um, directed them to use an extension that lets them fast forward through. And then uh, the students were able to select the videos that they were assigned in their group. So uh, if they click on the videos for group one, they're directed to this uh, folder in Google Drive with around uh, 21, 22 uh, videos of these mice. And each one is 20 minutes long. So we're talking you know, gigabytes, tens of gigabytes of, of video, high quality HD video here in this um, Google Drive folder. Uh, so they watch the video, and then they go to a, um, uh, they have a data sheet that they can write down their results. And then on the next page, they're actually asked to submit that data into a Google form. So they would, uh, for example, if they were to um, uh, look at mouse BK1, they'd go to the form, they would select that mouse, and then they would enter their data here. And now uh, the questions are required, and there also is some data validation on here. So uh, they can't enter 80 marbles, and um, they have to enter something between 0 and, uh, was it 20? I think there are 20 marbles in there. Correct. Um, right, yeah. So, uh, and then this, all of this um, data submission gets put into one uh, Google Sheet that then Dr. Boltito would gather and sort of work before the next week's uh, uh, class to um, sort of compile that and give it back to students for their um, analysis. So that's what the, and this is this was the same, we had parallel structures for each of the four data gathering um, uh, activities in the class and they all used this, this um, uh, method. So. John, can I jump in here? Please. So, uh, can you go back to the four groups of data sets? 
So the video data sets? Yeah, the video. OK, so. Uh, yeah, so, um, so the students uh, in the 0 and the 1 credit class would, would be assigned to one group. However, the students that are doing an individual study um, at the 300 level, 397 level, they are uh, mostly biology majors who take it as a, a W, um, a writing intensive class, or a capstone research experience class. And they would be required to um, analyze all the animals, 90 animals for three different behaviors of their choice um, to complete um, their course requirements in addition to writing a research paper describing their results. So they would act, because of the, the way this um, website is set up, they would click through all the groups and complete data collection on all the animals. And so I think this is quite unique to have a, a, a non-credit, a one-credit, and a three-credit class um, all using the same online backbone of, of this course. Um, and what that results in is that we have high school students, um, we have uh, postgraduate students, um, we have undergraduate biology majors, we have uh, psychology majors, engineering majors, mm -hmm. we're all in this class together. And we have undergraduate biology majors who are juniors or seniors who are taking this as an upper level class, all working together to get the best data set they could out of these animals. And I, th I think that that just worked out really, really uh -huh. well. Can I ask you a question, um, uh, Dr. Boltito, about how, how that um, sort of uh, diverse community uh, translated in the discussion forums? What, what were those like? That I was just baffled by the insight of the students. And sometimes, especially with the high school students, they, of course they have less experience with, with uh, critical thinking and things like that. But when they then read a post from a, a student who was taking the, you know, the individual study at the 300 level, they would come right back and respond to that student and really show that they understood. Um, what the other student was discussing, and and I was just so pleased with how well the students communicated with with each other on these discussion boards, and it was really my point to only at the, in the beginning in the in the first module or two I would give a, a little bit of feedback on the discussion board itself, but after that I I really took a step back and let right. the students discuss with each other. Mm -hmm. the results and how to interpret them, and that worked really well. Excellent. Yeah, I, th I thought that was a really, um, maybe not an intentional part of the course, but having, you know, those more advanced students and right. the beginning students work, you know, really working together and creating that scaffolding between them, I think that's just, um, yeah, that's excellent. Yeah, and I, I made sure to, uh, to have the, um, the 300 level students divided over the groups so that uh, you had an experienced biology major, um, at least one in each of the groups. And I think that worked really well as well. So actually, that's a good point, good moment maybe to bring it over to segue into the student experience even more. Um, more. Um, uh, but I wanted to mention, that as we were scrolling through that course, I was reminded that um, it was really a team effort uh, from all the people involved in creating this course, and I think we worked together very well. But uh, Kristen was particularly responsible for making it the whole thing look nice and be approachable, and uh, cleaning up all of the the flotsam and the jetsam left behind in the wake of construction. So I just wanted to mm -hmm. mention that. But um, so uh, Sean and I uh, had the pleasure of interviewing three students now from the course. And just kind of cursorially, uh, anecdotally, sharing some of their experiences. Um, and Sean, feel free to jump in if I leave anything out. Um, so we interviewed a couple of high school students who were actually taking this course from Cantwell, Alaska. Uh, they're a small school of 14 students, and they were presented with this opportunity to take, you know, behavioral neuroscience, doing live research on mice, learning about OCD and and uh, human behavioral disorders um, from uh, you know, Dr. Boltito here at a research university in their tiny small town in rural Alaska. 
So that's fantastic just there alone. In addition, they had only really wonderful things to say about uh, the course and about Dr. Boltito. Um, but mostly it was really neat that this fit into their interests and they felt very connected to Dr. Boltito. They felt like the videos and the activities and the research experiences, even though they did say, wow, there was a lot of videos to watch. Um, they got the idea that that's science, right? That it's, you know, you, if you're going to formulate opinions, there's some work behind them. So that was pretty neat. Um, and in one example in particular, one of the students said that uh, they had a they had a face to face teacher who visited their school um, part time. They were part time in one school district and part time in their school district, and they felt a stronger connection with Dr. Boltito than than um, they did with that individual. So we did our job well. That's what that tells me. That that's that's the the gold standard for online learning is that that feeling of con student connection between student and, and educator. So that's fantastic. Um, so. Uh, anything else on that, Sean, before I... Can I make a comment? Oh, please. Because that was... Uh, when I when I started um, getting the content together and talking with, with the team um, that, that are all on this, on this um, uh, video cast, um, I wanted to have a really big presence because when I looked at some of the MOOCs just to get an idea of what was going on in that field, I was bored to death. <laughs> <laughs> they were just lectures provided on a screen. I mean, it was boring like hell. So I decided that we needed to have short segments of content with a short video from me, from me two to five minutes, most of them, describing a particular aspect of, of that, um, that topic. And, and because I really wanted to have as much the students exposed to me as much as possible, but not in a lecture style. And and I I think oh, and what you just said, I I I'm so glad that it it seems to have worked. I I just wanted to say how it's like textbook perfect. How the balance between the number of videos and the length of the videos, and um, every of oh, the three students we interviewed, they all mentioned that without us prompting them, that the, those videos not only helped them um, access and understand the content, but it made them feel like they were in a real course being actively taught by a real person that they got to know over the course of the semester. Um, one of the, the students uh, mentioned that she found it really interesting when you discussed how you became allergic to, to mice bites and that you know she didn't even know you could become allergic to mice bites and hearing your story your personal story really helped her, um, you know, grasp grasp the concept, which was completely related to the the content of that module. Um, and I I really want to commend uh, you, Dr. Boltito, on ha the balance you took between uh, giving personal anecdotes um, with, you know, solid uh, content and keeping it um, sort of relatable. Uh, professional and and really concise. Uh, I I really should go back and count how many videos we have in the course. <laughs> Probably approaching a hundred. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and, and uh, just to comment on that, you know, the, the first few videos I I was taking retake after retake after retake. But now the only time I have to retake it is when I don't hit the the start button correctly and I don't record myself. So, so I, it just um, you know, it takes a little while to become familiar and and comfortable with with the medium that you're exposing yourself to, and, uh, and, and so it's been a great learning experience for me uh, doing this. Yeah, I, I think I can speak for all of us. It's been a great learning experience for all of us too, in different, multiple different facets. But uh, just briefly back to our student subjects again, and and to uh, repeat their accolades. Uh, a couple of them said that they had taken multiple online courses before, both high school and uh, the university student we interviewed said that yeah, I've taken other online courses before, and this one uh, was my best, strongest experience. So that's those are really good words, and so that those those types of um, first-hand stories, supports our uh, hopes for the design effort. So uh, shifting gears here, I'm not sure uh, if or how many people are watching in the live stream, but I just was wondering, Abel, um, where are we going to take it from here? What happens in the future? 
Well, um, there's a two major developments. Uh, we, uh, I'm going to offer these classes again in the spring of 2016, which was not the original idea, but I figured you know, having put in so much work to get this one to work really well, um, let's keep the momentum going, improve what we've been doing, and make the experience even more enriched for, for the students in, in the spring. Um, one of the additions is a hybrid course um, for biology majors. So this is a course where uh, it's, it's a 400 level instead of a 300 level, so the students will participate in the online class, but then um, instead of doing, for example, for a three credit class, doing all three behaviors where they have to analyze all 90 animals, they will do two behaviors online and then they design their own experiment, uh, get um, animal care approval for their experiment and then do the actual experiment in the lab themselves. So that is a, a hybrid approach um, where we combining in-person um, experience with the online experience. And then, uh, you know, for the, the site velo um, work, um, what I would really, what we're going to focus on is to make this hybrid not only for students who can come in person, but for students who are in a rural, in a rural uh, location. So the idea would be to have the student design the experiment, get the same um, approvals for the experiment, but then in real time guide a lab technician to do the experiment um, remotely and collecting the data that way. So then, again, the only thing that the student is not doing is handling the mice, but the design of the study, the um, execution of the study is all dependent on what the student tells the laboratory te technician. So that is going to be a challenge for, um, uh, hopefully, for m uh, getting the uh, infrastructure ready for that in the spring so that we can offer a, cl a class like that to a rural student uh, which will really give them the entire research experience online um, in the fall of next year. That's fantastic. That's going to be a great opportunity for students, I think. I mean, it's really amazing, actually. Um, so I know we have uh, at least one viewer out there in the world, and this would be a great time to ask questions um, if you have any, um, and it's fine if, if not. Um, but I want to just open up the floor to any other comments or... Sean or Kristen or Abel, um, if you guys have anything else to add to, to our experience. I just want to thank Dr. Boltito, too, for all of the momentum you brought to the project. It was really a pleasure to watch the course develop and watch it be delivered and to see how the students were receiving all of it. Um, I've been watching the question board here, and we don't have anything coming in at the moment, and we might just give a few more moments to see if, if anything comes through. Um, and other than that, um, I'll just let us hang on here for a few more moments. Okay, well, I'm, I'll, I have... I never seem to be short of things to talk about. So um, I will say that uh, one of the other interesting aspects of the course is how, how much we were sort of exposed back and forth to the, the behind-the-scenes functioning of Abel's department, his, his struggles to, to make the course happen. And I think him on our side, we had some significant uh, technical hurdles to overcome. We got – there's a couple different brands of, of Canvas, the LMS – and we got sidetracked into one particular one we started working with and had to up stakes and move to the other one uh, pretty far in the development process. It was a bit of a, um, I had a sleepless night myself, so, uh, but we made it. And uh, now, you know, the course of these hundred videos or something that Abel's put together, they live out there in this great shell and uh, it's going to be an ongoing really strong resource for students, so. Well, if I, if I could jump in here and, yeah. and thank you, Owen, Sean, and Kristen, for your incredible support, because that, that was just crucial for me to be able to focus on the content, to focus on what I w wanted to tell the students, and not having to worry about uploading it, this and that, and having it look good, and having to deal with Canvas network, and how to work that system. You know, this was a true collaboration, so, so thank you all for that. It, it, it's been an amazing experience, and I can't wait to do it again this spring. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, maybe that's a great moment to end on. Um, thank you, uh, 
Sean and Kristen and Abel. And uh, Kristen, I know you have to close off the official series, but um, I'll just say thanks and I'll sign off. Thanks, Owen, and thanks to the rest of the team. Uh, as a reminder for our viewers, this is our last Teaching Tip Live for the semester. We'll be starting back up in 2016 with a whole new lineup. And if you're following along, you can um, go to our ITHU faculty development calendar and see what new topics are coming up for 2016. And with that, uh, thanks again, everybody. You guys did a wonderful job. Have a happy holidays, everyone. Happy holidays, everyone. <laughs>